And I'm especially happy. Um, what? Okay. Thank you. Um, the recording has just now been started. Thank you very much. Um, as I was just going to say, I'm especially happy uh, to welcome you today, Mark, to give this lecture today for us. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we're all really delighted that so many people have decided to join us for Mark's talk today. As far as I can see, we're already 54 people in this chat right now and more might still uh, come to join us. So that's really great. Um, introductions. My name is Doris Jetzinger. I'm one of the four Arbeitskreissprecherinnen of the um, AK Neolithikum and Bronze Zeit, and I will be leading uh, through today's lecture. So to start with, I'm going to give you some technical information to ensure a smooth procedure for everyone. Firstly, please make sure that your microphone remains switched off unless you're asked to speak during the question and answer session after the talk. To switch your microphone off and on, please use the microphone icon, which you can find on the bottom left-hand side of your Zoom screen next to the camera icon. If this icon is crossed out, your mic is off, and the same is also true for your camera. In the middle on the bottom of your screen, you can see the participants and the chat icons, also the Teilnehmer und Chat um, Knöpfe. Clicking those will allow you to observe who is participating and will give you access to the chat, respectively. You can also see the reactions icon, the Reaktionen. By clicking this icon, you get access to the raise hand button, this Handheben Zeichen. And please use the raise hand button to indicate that you have a question and don't forget to lower your hand again after you've asked your question. I would ask you to please save your questions for the official question and answer session after the talk. Um, during the session, please use the raise hand icon if you have a question, as I said, and we will then call on you to ask your question. You can also switch on your camera for asking the question if you like. Um, alternatively, you can also just post your question in the chat and we will read it out aloud for you. Um, if you're unsure about phrasing your question in English, that's not a problem at all. Please just write your question into the chat in German and we will then translate it for you. If you should encounter any technical problems during the lecture or if you have any general questions, please just leave us a message in the chat or contact us via email and we will try to help. We will post our working group's email address in the chat uh, presently. And finally, I've got to remind you that this lecture is being recorded. The recording has already been started. And um, due to this recording, it is also possible that your face um, is visible or your voice may be audible on the recording. And if you don't agree to this, I have to ask you to please leave the lecture now. And finally, We've also organized an informal uh, post colloquium online, which we are hosting via the platform wonder.me. And Mark has agreed to join us for this little get together, which we are really, really uh, excited about. And we are hoping that many of you are going to join us as well. And yeah, come together with us for a little more discussion and talking. I'll remind you of this again after the talk. And we will also uh, post the access, uh, the access info in the chat presently. Okay, and now, uh, without any further ado, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you tonight's lecturer, Mark Knight. Mark is a senior project officer with the Cambridge Archaeological Unit. This is a research-oriented archaeological unit with special expertise in wetland and urban archaeology, as well as landscape studies, among others. Mark joined the Cambridge Archaeological Unit in 1995, and he specializes in researching prehistoric landscapes, the prehistoric fence, and Neolithic and Bronze Age pottery. His research interests include exploring the later prehistoric contexts of inhabitation and mobility and comprehending the lives of people in southern Britain between 3600 and 800 BC. He was acting as the site director at the CAU's excavation of the Bronze Age settlement site at Must Farm, and in 2017 he won the Archaeologist of the Year Award at the current Archaeology Awards. And yeah, as we all know, Must Farm is a truly fascinating site. Some great research has taken place. The research is still ongoing as data is being analyzed and public publications are being prepared. So I'm really, really excited for Mark's talk now, and I'm guessing you are all as well. So Mark, you've already shared your presentation. Um, you can now go into the full screen mode and I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Just check that this works. 
Is that good? Yes, perfect. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to um, to come and speak this evening. Uh, my talk is about the Must Farm Power Dwelling Settlement Landscape, Architecture and Occupation 850 BC. Um, I think to begin with, I need to give you the context of the Power Dwelling Settlement, the description of its landscape setting, both present and past, um, and then follow that up with a contextual account of the actual Power Dwelling Settlement, its architecture, material culture, and biological remains. For the former of these two parts, it's necessary for me to to describe the landscape to give you a sense of, of its particular qualities and why it is that it might preserve such amazing um, prehistoric archaeology. And for the second part, it's important also that it, to give the context of the power driving settlement is to, is to think about its place within this sort of deeper landscape history and in terms of its, its own sort of duration and, and circumstance of, of where it sits within, within that landscape story. So as an introduction to, to Fenland, um, the most important factor I suppose about it is its flatness, its, its horizontalness, the, the fact that it's without any sort of vertical element, it's, it's as flat as it can be. Um, and sometimes this is seen as a sort of, I don't know, a, a negative quality about, about working in this, in this location. Um, but anyone that works there soon gets to understand that, that as, it has other, other qualities um, that basically what it lacks for in height, did it makes up for in depth. So to give ourselves a, a location, this is Fenland, situated in Eastern England. Um, Must Farm is situated just about here. It's, it's, this, is, this is an image of, of England as an obscuration map. It, it shows which parts of the landscape are deeply buried and therefore not suitable for aerial photography or geophysical survey or, or basically obscured from normal sort of surface perspective. And then if we go in closer, we can actually see that, that although it's obscured in terms of the sort of blanket peaks that infill the Fenland Basin, the, the, the sort of the modern invention of LIDAR allows us to actually see that it's actually a very textured landscape. And there is that possibility of actually seeing beneath the surface through very subtle changes in its topography. So this is the Fenland Basin. Um, down here is Cambridge, over here is Peterborough, and up here is the North Sea or the Wash. And you can see that the, the southern fens are coloured on this LIDAR diagram, have the same colour as the North Sea, they pretty much sit at sea level. And this is what's known as the Peat Fens or the Cambridgeshire Fens. And the location of Must Farm is over here next to Peterborough on the, the western edge of the Fenland Basin, pretty much where the, the river, the current River Nee, debouches out of the limestone into the soft deposits of, of the Fens itself. If we go in again closer, with the use of LIDAR and, and the use of our, our borehole data and various other interventions, we've been able to create a sort of a, a link between the surface detail and the paleotopography and create this model of, of, of our landscape. And this is an area known as the Flag Fen Basin. It's a small embayment on the western edge of, of the main Fenland Basin. And it's famous for the Flag Fen Causeway um, and the work of Francis Pryor and the Fenland Archaeological Trust back in the 1980s. It's also the location of a paleo channel, which I've marked here in blue, um, which is the location of the Must Farm Power Dwelling Settlement. And we're able to map that because it has a very strong signature on the surface. It's a, a channel that has a, a, a marine origin and a freshwater sort of end. And in its marine phase, it silts up with very pale colored sands and silts and becomes a very consolidated feature on a landscape that's made up of dark peat. And therefore, with the, the drainage of the fence for modern agriculture, it, it comes to the surface and shows us this very sort of marked, sinuous shape on, on, on the surface of, of the fields. But otherwise, the, the sort of the depth of deposits is, is difficult to fathom from, from the surface itself. And the only way to really understand Fenland is, is by digging into it. And we one of the sort of 
common attributes of our evaluation of this landscape is to is to dig test pits into that into that sediment to to expose its its buildup. And this is this is sort of standard really for Fenland. You can go up to six or seven meters deep and encounter layers of peat and marine silts of large inundations and things, which basically encapsulate pretty much the whole of the Holocene. And therefore, the infilling of the Fenland Basin is, is pretty much commensurate with, with later prehistory. So from a, pretty much from the 8000 BC right up to, to the present. But at the same time as digging deep holes, you can also dig shallow holes and go down only 80 centimetres and whether you've got a shallow cover of peat. And beneath that, you find these buried land surfaces. And, and, and in addition to that, there are preserved earthworks of, of prehistoric features. This is a, a bank of a Middle Bronze Age field system being preserved within, within that deposit. The other way of getting exposure or, or finding apertures into the, these deeply buried landscapes is, is by chance, basically, by going into old openings into, into the, the peat deposits. So the dikes are often used as ways of getting a sort of survey of, of the, the buried landscape, but also old quarry pits and things like that, which are already sort of ready-made exposures. And this picture here is a picture of the Moss Farm Quarry in 1999. And the chap in the image is a man called P Martin Redding. And this is the point of discovery. He's, what he's staring at is a series of large oak posts sticking out the side of the sort of slightly lower water of this, this old quarry pit. And this was the first recognition that there might be something interesting on this side of the Flag Fen Basin. In 2004, we evaluated it and got radiocarbon dates from the post, which came back as late Bronze Age. In 2006, we did further evaluation and recognised that it was a site of importance and had lots of material culture associated with it. And in 2015, we excavated the site in its entirety. And on this image here, you can see the quarry workings. It's basically they're extracting clay to make bricks and they go down 20 meters. So it's this sort of ideal hole in, into the, into the Fenland Basin in terms of trying to get at those sort of deeper sediments. And this white, big white shed that you can see here is the location of the excavation of the Musk Farm Padron. And the advantage we have of working in, in a brick pit and working with these developers is, is that they, they're able to go to great depth and, and not drown. They, they pump out the water and they expose the, what they call overburden and what we call the Holocene succession on a, on a yearly basis. And we're able to create these grand sections um, through the Fen deposit sequence. So in here, this is very much the sort of the character of the whole of Fen and you have this lower peat what's known as the fen clay or marine sediment, and then upper peat. And that deposit sequence um, represents the Holocene succession. So you can get Mesolithic at the bottom and Iron Age archaeology at the top. At the same time, in the deeper parts, it also holds paleo channels and, and large watercourses and things that represent paleo courses of the River Neen. And it's interesting, really, because in a sense, the discovery of, of, of Moss Farm is, has been dependent on being able to, to dig deep, to, to get beneath the surface and, and stop being superficial about, about, about this landscape. And it harks back to um, the 1930s when Graham Clark and the, the Fenland Research Committee excavated a, a, a sondage at Peacock's Farm and went down eight metres into the, into the sediment and exposed that, that same sequence of the lower peat, the fen clay and the upper peat. But more importantly, we're able to demonstrate um, what Clark called this sort of delicate chronological scale, this sort of succession of sediment in relationship to, to prehistoric occupation. So down here, we found a layer of Mesolithic flint. Above that, there was a layer of early Neolithic pottery. And then above the, the marine, marine deposit, we found early Bronze Age pottery and flint. And this is back in the 1930s when, when most of our sort of typologies were, or our understanding of periods was based on typologies. And this was actually a, a clear articulation of the relationship between sets of material culture, and hence why Clark called it his delicate chronological scale. But as well as, as understanding that Fennon gave you this articulation of past context, Clark was also aware that there was a relationship between the gradient and the availability of land, or what he called the surface available for settlement. 
So he created a series of diagrams. So for the Mesolithic, there's lots of surface available for settlement, but by the early Bronze Age, there's only a small area available for settlement. And in a way, this, this model has come to dominate um, research in Finland. It's this idea that people are looking for islands and, and raised ground or raised contours in order to find archaeology. And there's also a correspondence with the fact that the deep sediments of Finland are, other than agriculture, are not very good for development. People don't want to live on them because you sink into those deposits. So most development in this landscape is, is up on the, the higher contours, which has meant that in more recent times, most of our understanding of Finland archaeology has been at the edge of the Fens, not actually in the Fens. We've built these models based upon the sort of Fen edge, and they've come to dominate. But it's also that landscape is a place where, where preservation is, is, is poor. It tends to be the inorganic that's preserved or negative features. Um, and, it, and it sort of pretty much looks like any other archaeology um, elsewhere in, in, in southern Britain. And what's happened in a way is that the, the sequence of deposits and the sort of environmental texture that they reflect and the adjacent dry land have been sort of disconnected. And we've ended up with this sort of model of, of, of basically a dry land being where people settled and then the various deposits being different environments which they settled beside. And there's a sort of disconnection. And it's almost been forgotten that the deposits themselves are actually formed throughout the Neolithic and the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, and that they have a relationship to that gradient. And that if you go beneath these deposits, you can find that archaeology in, in an articulation. And of course, the advantage that we have within the quarry is, is that unlike Clark having to dig a small hole and dig it quickly, we can keep going back year on year and actually expose these deposits and dig them in the full articulation. And it's, it's made the difference in terms of our discovery and our understanding of, of past contexts within, within Finland itself. So back to our, our, our map of the Flagfen Basin and the Paleo Channel. This is Whittlesea Island. Um, it sits at about seven metres above sea level at its centre. But in our landscape, we, we tend to start at about sea level and start working our way down to about minus four metres. Um, the quarry is situated just here. And this is on the sort of safe eastern corner of what's known as the Flagfen Basin. And our understanding of the Flag Fen Basin, in a way, is a sort of microcosm for the Greater Fen Basin itself. It's a, it's a concave-shaped landscape. It's a, it's, a, it's a basin that basically, with the, the rising of sea levels and the grey water table, it gets wetter and wetter over time and peat starts to form and it slowly, it slowly gets infilled. And it's what Rob Scaves calls a, 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 a negative hydrosphere. So it's basically there are old land surfaces at, at its base that get covered by peat over time and it, it basically gets wetter and wetter until eventually it is actually standing water. Um, and this is, this is a, a, a sort of progressive effect. So if you wanted to model the flag fen basin or if you wanted to model Fenland itself, you could end up drawing a, a diagram something like this, which is basically a concave shaped landscape with an exaggerated time transgressive environment. So if this was Clark's excavation, the Mesolithic would be at the bottom here and the, the Bronze Age would be up here. But it's that relationship, I suppose, between space and time in a sense that we have this vertical succession of deposit, we have this expanse that we're able to excavate at scale, but also we have this gradient, which also stands for movement. And we get this sort of wonderful sort of articulation of context. We also get this thing where the deposits intercede, so they, they get between different events and it basically, it negates superimposition. We, we rarely deal with palimpsest, we mostly deal with things still in full articulation with very little interference from later activities or, or, or indeed that sort of sense of trying to disentangle a whole series of events and things, the deposits do that for you. So in terms of the flag fen basin and this succession of, of deposits, we can separate um, the, the British Bronze Age into sort of three periods of early, middle and late. And we can characterise those periods by beginning with monuments and ending with settlement. And with the, the sort of field systems or land enclosures sort of sitting in between the two. And it's often the, the Bronze Age of, of southern Britain, at least, has been characterised by this idea at the beginning, we can find the dead, but not the living. And at the end, we can find the living, but not the dead. 
there's a sense that we have landscapes of monuments with inhumations and cremations in the early Bronze Age. We have landscapes of, of roundhouses and enclosures and settlements at the, the end of the Bronze Age. And the only place we actually find human remains in the later Bronze Age is, is, is in settlements themselves in, in disarticulated form. So as an example of that, that sort of sequence of things, this is uh, Benin Washes, just the north of Musk Farm. Um, this is an area that's basically reserved for, for flood events um, to basically push water out to the North Sea to make sure that the drain fens itself can still be used for agriculture. And in there, there are barrow fields still preserved. You can just about see a, the top of a round barrow sticking out just there. And when this landscape floods, you can see that the barrows stick up like sort of humpback wells swimming down the Benin and things. It sort of, it exaggerates that subtle topography and that, that flat space that we're so used to suddenly has a, a sort of a subtle topography that actually reflects um, past activity. And if you take a test pit next to one of these um, burial mounds, you go down about a meter 80 before you, you reach the old land surface, which is contemporary with, with these monuments. So they are, they are, massive constructions but deeply buried within that with that in a, with, with the, the accumulation of peat. So if we go back to the flag fen basin and we create it as a as a, an early Bronze Age landscape, so here's our paleo channel again coming through um, a deeper trough. This is the location of Must Farm where the star is. This is Peterborough over here and this is the island of Whittlesea. And at that point in the early Bronze Age, those barrows I just showed you in the mean washes are basically occupying a, a terrestrial space. And you could, you could cross from one side of the basin to the other without getting your feet wet. But as we progress into the Middle Bronze Age, when the field systems are being constructed, we start to see reed swamp and, and natural flood meadows forming and things. And this becomes a, a saturated space. And it's only seasonally um, occupied during the summer months and things. And it's a landscape that's dominated by, by these field systems. By the later Middle Bronze Age, so around about 1300 BC, it actually becomes much more um, saturated, subsumed within the, the accretion of peat. And we start seeing um, a response to that in the building of these causeways. So famously, the flag fan causeway, a whole series of postal alignments crossing from one piece of dry land to another, but also within our own excavation beneath the the power dwelling settlement, we find another causeway making up the crossing over this side of the, of the basin. So that, that sort of relationship between the sort of architecture and, and the, the changing texture of the environment is being played out here. And then by the very end of the Bronze Age, we're into the middle of the ninth century BC, um, we see the construction of the Must Farm power dwelling settlement in basically what is, uh, is bog, is, is marshland. And there's no, it's, there's more peat than there is land within within our within our landscape that we're, we're investigating. And you can characterise that in a in a in a sort of diagrammatic dramatic form. So we can have the the Bronze Age being played out from the the beginning to the end, and even into the Iron Age. And we can see monuments dominating the the archaeological record at the start, hill systems in the centre, and then settlements at the end. But also we can bring in that that division between dry and wet and take ourselves out on those causeways and out into the, the river channels and find out there's, a, there's another story going on that's contemporary with that sort of more familiar orthodox model of, of sort of the, the, the story of, of archaeology in, in the British Bronze Age. So back to our, our, our big section through the, through the flag fan basin, uh, the thing to focus on here is this, this big dark smile which is this um, later Bronze Age freshwater channel that sits within a, a much earlier marine channel underneath. In 2010, 11 and 12, we excavated a stretch of 320 metres of this paleo channel um, and we did it in, in detail. And, and this goes back to that sense of the, the quality of, of Fenland in terms of its preservation is that basically it's not truncated. Uh, the, the preservation is not just about the preservation of organics, but it's actually about the preservation of context. So as you can see from this section, we get the whole of the Paleo Channel in, in full articulation. So it dates to 1600 BC at the bottom and 100 BC at the top. You can just see the sort of peak growth across the top, but these are basically freshwater silts. And it's a Paleo Channel with no 
with no energy about it. It's, it's not stagnant, but it's very, very sluggish. So any sort of deposition that occurs within its length tends to stay where it was put. So in that succession of river silts, at the very base of the channel, so dating to about 1600 BC, we find a whole series of, of Bronze Age fish weirs forming sort of chevrons across the, the centre of the channel. So there are 10 of these in, in regular space across the base of that, of that length of channel. And in association with the, the, the fish weirs, we also find um, 24 fish tracks or eel tracks um, equally well preserved. And the, the, the beauty of the sediment of the, the Paleo Channel is, is that it, it's, if you pick up a lump of this silt and you squeeze it in your hand, it's not full of water, but it's, its preservation qualities is, is that it's completely non-porous. So anything that's organic and wet that's been deposited within it basically is, is completely contained and, and, and safe from any exposure to, to, to oxygen. So you get this, these beautiful preservation conditions, but also, it's the best sediment ever to excavate. It's like digging, digging Play-Doh. It just it allows you to present your archaeology beautifully, beautifully too. So this is a, another example of one of the traps within, within the channel. So the, the traps and the weirs are situated towards the base of the, of the Paleo Channel, but all the way up through that, that sequence, we also found the remains of nine log boats. So this is a log boat from close to the very close to the base of the channel. This is... Um, dates to, a, I think, again, 1600 BC. It's made of oak, it has a, a transom at the end and a, a handle at the front. And it's one of nine that, that occurred within, within the that 320 meters length. Closer to the surface, um, this is a, a later Bronze Age boat, it's nearly nine meters in length, um, again, made of oak. Um, and, it's, and it's been truncated. It's actually had its sides removed. You can see that where the transom slot still being preserved at one end. But the best thing about this slide is that it just shows to you the, the scale of our, of our investigations, but also just how pristine it is as a context to excavate. So the rainwater is actually starting to turn the channel back into a channel again. And these bits of top hole, and you can see here, are covering up fish tracks. So there's this real sense that everything's pretty much as it was left. And that deposition is actually really meaningful. It's very different in the way of, of disturbance or reworking of, of materials. There's a real confidence, again, of context. And in this same context, we are finding bits of human remains and, and metalwork. So in plan, our Palo Channel, our 320 meter stretch, looks like this. So these are the, the chevrons of the fish weirs. These are the, the fish traps, the green triangles and metalwork. And then you can see the various log boats in their location within the channel. So it's almost like a sort of, I don't know, an aerial view of a, of, a, of a watercourse still in use. If we put that into its context, um, you can see the, the Pelo Channel with the weirs and the traps here. And then if we go 200 metres downstream, we can go to the site of the Must Farm Pile Dwelling. So it shares the exact same context as, as all the things that I've just described. So in section, the Pelo Channel at the position of the, the Must Farm Pile Dwelling looks like this. So you have to remember that the, the northern side has been truncated by the, by the quarry pit. So this is the edge where Martin first saw posts sticking out the side. And this is a, a, a interpretation of that section and the, the sort of pinky red layer in the center is the horizon that contained the, the pile dwelling settlement. And this is inside the, the big white shed in the excavation. And you can see, so the same silts that were preserving the fish traps on the log boats and the fish weirs are also basically what has, has engulfed the, the remains of the settlement. And our excavation technique was pretty much as much about digging with the tips of your fingers as it was with digging with trials and things. And we were able to, to articulate the settlement in the same way that we were able to articulate those wonderful wattle traps. So this is the, the site and it's pretty much in its entirety inside the big white shed. So in this image, we've got the southern bank of the channel running along here. We've got the palisade that encloses the settlement itself. The center of the channel is about here. And within that enclosure, you can see a series of, of collapsed roofs of, of the, the stilted dwellings within, within the settlement itself. At the same time, um, just to give a bit of extra context, 
just running along here, there's a, a much earlier oak causeway. You can just see these big black sort of pointed piles, much very different in terms of their character to the rest of the Pardoline settlement, forming this sort of oblique line across the channel. And that looked like this. This is a, a causeway that's contemporary with the Flagfen Causeway. It dates to somewhere between sort of the middle of the 15th century BC through to the, the end of the 10th century BC. Um, and it's associated with metalwork deposition, but it's about crossing a landscape. It just happens to be crossing this part of our, of our channel. So in, in relationship to the pile dwelling settlement and the fish weirs and fish traps, it sits in between the two. So its context is, is here. But now I'll focus on the, the pile dwelling settlement itself. So our understanding of the, the silts that are in association with the settlement is that it's telling us about a fully established fen fringed by coral woodland. It's densely, densely vegetated, it's slow flowing on a still water. And it's, and it's basically, it's a fresh water um, dominated by slow flowing still water types in terms of its diatoms. And the reason I put the slide up really is to give you a sense of, of the context of deposition that this is a, a channel that's barely moving, but it's also, it's very densely vegetated. So it has this thing we call the hairbrush effect, which it basically, it's a whole series of reeds and rushes sticking up that are basically anything that falls into that context gets trapped in, the, in that vegetation. So it adds to that sense of, of our confidence in context in terms of the spatial distribution of things that are deposited into that, into that horizon. So back to our settlement, this is it in plan. This is the, um, so the quarry edge is across here. This is all of the wood planned. Um, you can see the, the palisade is a series of uprights running along here. And then you can see the, the roof bands of individual structures, basically the rafters where the, the buildings have collapsed into the channel and sort of splayed out. The other thing to understand about this plan is, is that the majority of the uprights are preserved by being waterlogged, whereas the majority of the horizontals are preserved by being charred and waterlogged. So the conflagration, the, the fire that burnt our settlement and basically collapsed it into the river um, is, is, is evident on, on most of the horizontals, whereas the verticals were beneath the water and their preservation is, is, is due to waterlogging. So to look closer at the settlement itself, we can see one of the structures. These are the, the roof rafters you can see fanning out. You can see the oak uprights of, of one of the structures um, running around and then an inner ring inside of that. And basically as, as, as architecture, it's very simple. It's a series of, of trees that are sort of young oaks and ashes dating to the sort of 40 to 50 years old. They are, they are basically failed. The, the felling ends are given a few extra facets to turn them into points. They trim their branches, but they leave the bark and the sapwood on, and then they're driven deep into the, into the underlying sediment. And the same goes for the palisade, which is predominantly ash as opposed to oak. But basically it's a whole series of similar diameter uprights driven deep into the, into the sediment. So it's quite, it's quite basic in terms of, of the sort of conversion or carpentry. They, they're, they're pretty much trees without their branches being driven in, into the deposit. But what's also really interesting about that is, is that there's a real regularity in terms of their diameter and, and in terms of what types of species that are being used in the construction of the settlement itself. Even better, and this goes back to that sort of vegetation um, aspect, is the, is the sense that the, the, the wood chips of construction associated with those oak and ash uprights is, is, is preserved in the, in, the, in the base of the channel. So what you can see here, are these are ash and oak wood chips that were generated by the sharpening of those points and the driving them into the, into the sediment itself. And there's a real strong correlation between where the ash wood chips are and where the ash uprights are and the oak wood chips and the oak uprights. And this is a plan of the wood chips within, within the settlement plan. And the reason I put this up is, is that, again, it's that sense of how it inspires the confidence in us that the other distributions that I will be talking about are actually meaningful and that we're not just looking at a fluvial environment that's basically just washed everything in and, and mixed everything around. There's a real sense here of, of deposition being um, 
a dynamic that's close to where things were originally deposited and therefore had a relationship to the settlement itself. So if we look at the construction of the settlement it, itself, we can see that the oak piles um, represent the primary structures. So the, the palisade was, was, was laid out by, by marking it out with oak posts. And then the individual structures, you can see this is structure one, our best preserved roundhouse. You can see the outer ring and the inner ring there. And then the ash piles were introduced to basically complete the settlement. So again, this sort of coherent pattern of, of construction. And then if we look at that in detail, um, we're able to, to understand the settlement as being um, enclosed by the palisade, having a raised walkway just on its inside, and then consisting of four circular structures built on piles with a raised walkway between or running down the middle of, of those four structures. And then in addition to that, there's a square structure that's introduced that's, that's added to that sequence um, slightly after the, the main settlement plan has been built. It's almost as if it's been sort of squeezed into available space. And this is uh, just a, an example of this is the, that raised walkway running between structures one and two and its preservation. So this is structure one, the best preserved house. And as I said, it, it's, it's circular. It's about eight metres in diameter. And if I highlight this sort of different elements, you can see that uh, this is the ash palisade running on the outside. This is the, the supports for the, um, the palisade walk. And then we've got 10 oak piles around the outside and then six oak piles in the inside. And then in addition to that, we've got the roof rafters forming like spokes in the wheel. Now on, on excavation of realizing that we both had individual piled structures, but also that we had collapsed roofs. We set about doing a lot of sampling for dendrochronology in the hope that we could get some sort of precision on that phasing or construction of the settlement. Um, to our disappointment, the, 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 the ring, the, the growth cycles of the trees themselves, there isn't an existing match or reference for us to, to date them. But Ian Tyres, the dendrochronologist, was able to say that with, with real confidence that basically all the posts used in the construction of the settlement were failed in the same year. So what he called his year zero. And that, that the, therefore the settlement was built as one. He also said that the roof rafters and the charring patterns on the outside of them from when the settlement burnt down had caused a distortion to the, the, the outer pores or the outer rings of, of the oak rafters. And he suggested that, that that distortion wouldn't have happened if the wood was seasoned. And therefore he suggests that the wood was still green at the point of the complication. And therefore he suggested that our settlement was constructed as one and was burnt down as one. And that this happened within perhaps as little as 12 months. So we have a settlement that basically has a duration of, of perhaps a year or even less than a year. So this is structure one with the roof taken off and you can see here that we've got um, one quarter left with uh, the roof rafters, we've got the inner ring and outer ring. You can see the wood chips sitting on the, the riverbed, um, but also if you look closely you can actually see the remnants of the wattle floors. So in effect we've got a, a structure where the with the, the burning of the building and the, the failure of the walls and floors and the weight of the roof the roof has come down and taken the floors into the base of the channel. And we get this sort of, it's almost like a, a coffee plunger, basically taking the contents of each structure into the, into the base of the, of the river. So this is uh, the mapping of what's left of the floors themselves. So it's, it's basically, it's lots of round wood charcoal, but in some places it was still articulated as, as parts of wattle panels. And the same goes for the walls as well. And then underneath those raised floors of those structures, we found these older and willow poles that had been driven at angles into the underlying river sediments and then bent over to form these sprung arches beneath the floors themselves to give it a sort of tensile sort of springy support. And then around the, the tops of the, of the uprights, we, we found the remains of these mortise beams that basically tied the, the two, the inner ring and the outer ring of the structure. Um, and that these mortise beams have these protection marks 
running along the underside where they basically something was preventing these parts of the beams from being burnt. You can see it's, it's a consistent attribute of all of those, those beams. And we think it's where the, the sails of the wattle panels were pressed against the underside of the, the ring beams when the structures were burnt and it's protected those, those, those parts of the, of the structure. So our reconstruction of Roundhouse One looks something like this. So we have a, it's a very simple roundhouse with rafters, purlins, ring beams, floor joists, um, and it's made from oak and ash predominantly, but the smaller elements being also supplemented with alder and, and, and willow. Um, and it, most of it's still in the round and still has the bark on it, apart from the mortise beams, which are the, the main bit of carpentry involved in its construction. And just to give you a very sort of simplified sense of, of, its, um, of its reconstruction, this is a, just a, a, very, a very simple model made of, of structure one and, and its relationship to the, to the palisade, but a sense of a, a classic British Bronze Age roundhouse, only that it's built on piles, which is something that we, we, we've never seen before. And to illustrate that, that sort of analogy, at the top of this image, I have a, a standard double ring roundhouse of the sort of terrestrial variety that you could find anywhere in, in Britain. Um, an inner ring of substantial posts and an outer ring of the wattle and door wall, and this idea of a sort of centre and periphery. And at the bottom is our must farm concentric post ring roundhouse built on piles, but basically the same diameter consisting of two rings of posts. And in terms of, of its diameter and its relationship to what's commonly found on land, it's, it's eight metres in diameter. It has a, an internal space of 48.2 metres squared area. And, it, and the, the house on the right hand side of this image is a, an early Iron Age, Iron Age structure that we excavated up on Whittlesea Island. So it's about half a kilometre away from the pile dwelling settlement and pretty much contemporary um, in terms of its date. And you can see that they're, they're very similar in terms of the space available. And back in 1999, when we excavated this early Iron Age roundhouse, we, um, we occupied it for a photograph to give a sense of scale. And I think, though this image is just slightly sort of humorous, I quite like it in the sense that it gives you an idea of the internal floor space of the Must Farm pile dwelling roundhouses. So, as well as the architecture, there's also the material culture. There's the all of the contents that was trapped beneath the roofs or had been deposited off the side of the buildings during the duration of the settlement itself. So in encountering all of that wood, we also encountered this matrix, which was made up of, of clay and turf and thatch from the roof coverings, the charcoal of the, the remnants of the floors and walls, but also all of the material culture that was present within the settlement itself. And all of that was represented in approximately 15 to 20 centimetres of, of of sediment. So on this section you've got river sediment here, you've got river sediment there, and this is the whole of the pile dwelling sediment. So that idea that was just um, interpreted by the dendrochronologist about this idea of a very short duration is also played out in terms of uh, the associated stratigraphy. We don't have lots and lots of lamination or, or a deposition, it's a, it's a very brief episode in the history of the river. Um, we, we sieved that deposit in its entirety. We sieved it through a four millimetre mesh and on average a 10 litre sample looked a bit like this. So the majority of it is, is the remnants of, of the floors and walls of small round wood charcoal or charred bark, but also in short, in, included um, spores from the sides of pot, uh, pottery vessels, fragments of shell, bits of fish bone, um, charred seeds and, and um, and bits of, of thatch and things like that. So this is a sort of typical um, 10 litre sample from, from that deposit. Um, in excavation, the, the, the two dominant forms of sort of materials associated with the architecture were, in terms of numbers, were pottery and animal bone. And on this image, I, I basically plotted in red the distribution of pottery and in blue the distribution of animal bone. And there was a distinct pattern in the sense that the complete pots sat within the footprints of the structures, whereas the potsherds sat in the areas around the structures, which we called our sort of formative middens. And likewise, the articulated um, animal bone were inside the structures, whereas the majority of the 
butchered and processed and disarticulated animal bone also form parts of these sort of formative middens around the, the circumference of the standing structures. And again, to go back to what we said about the wood chips and things, there's a real confidence that these materials were where they were deposited. So to give an example, this is um, beneath structure four, and you can see that it's made up of complete pots and wooden vessels. Whereas if we go outside the structures, we get these sort of very sort of thin formative midden dumps, which includes pot sherds, um, butchered animal bones, bits of antler, burnt stones, all the things you'd expect to find within a later Bronze Age midden accumulation. Although interestingly, like everything else, it's still very thin and, and very formative. Again, ind indicative of that shortened duration. So this is a, an example of, of a red deer antler still attached to a fragment of skull, but you can see around it there are bits of bone, but also you can see the proximity of the, the, the midden deposit and the wood chips of construction. Again, that, that, that sense of, of brevity. Inside the structures, we're finding these um, complete articulated um, lambs that aged between three to six months old um, and basically alive at the point of the conflagration. We know that partly through their articulation, but also the fact that in association with the lambs, we also found charred lamb droppings. So you can see basically that there was a strong correspondence between the two. Equally, in the midden deposits around the structures, we found um, coprolites, mostly dog faeces, but also human faeces. Um, and these are often found to contain fragments of, of fish bone. And there's a real sense that the dogs and the, and the people were eating a similar diet. So in terms of distribution of the, the um, animal bone and the, the, the droppings and things, you can see that the green dots show where the lamb droppings were and the blue dots show where the lambs were found. The red dots are the, are the dog poos and the yellow dots are where the dogs are found. So there's a correlation there between where the dogs were being kept and where the lambs are being kept. And again, a sort of reassurance of, of the patterns being, being real. Um, on top of that, uh, we took all of the animal bone from the midden deposits and we laid it out and we did a refitting exercise trying to get at the actual numbers of, of animals and what kind of animals were being processed and what kind of processes were used in, the, in their butchery or their consumption. And we were able to find um, the component parts or parts of wild boar, red deer and pigs um, sitting in these midden deposits. But interestingly, we weren't able to reconstruct um, whole animals. It was consistently portions, left or right, um, quarters basically of, of singular animals um, and there's a real sort of dynamic there of, of just sort of portions of boar and deer and pig being consumed and then deposited within these within these middens and there's a sense also that these animals are being killed off-site they're being slaughtered skinned and prepared and then these sort of portions are being brought onto site for consumption um, and there's a real characteristic about later Bronze Age butchery techniques where animals are being split down the center uh, and that the vertebrae you get left and right sides of them, but we were unable to ever fit a left side of a vertebrae to a right side. So there's a real sense that half an animal came to our settlement and maybe the other half of the animal went to another settlement. So as well as the animal bone, we've also got the, the pottery. Um, and the pottery inside the structures was, was on the whole complete and comprised tiny little thumb pots, small cups, small bowls, um, small fineware bowls, as well as large storage vessels. And this is a, a real sort of spectacular find within structure four, which is a large storage vessel with a medium sized storage vessel and then a small storage vessel inside of that. So there's a nested set that appears never to have been used that was brand new that had arrived on the site, you know, perhaps just prior to the congregation. But as well as whole vessels, there are also sherds of vessels that have been broken during the lifetime of the settlement. So as with the animal bone, we, we took the pottery and we laid it out on the, the carpet and we, we basically we laid it out by its grid squares and we, we spent six days putting it all back together again. Um, and basically we, we went from a site that appeared to be made up of cups and bowls and 
and some more jars into a site that was also dominated by these large storage vessels. And this vessel is about 50 centimetres tall. So you can see the dynamic of our project, the refitting started like this and ended like this. And from 2,188 sherds, we were able to reconstruct 128 pottery vessels. And we were left with a, a very small tray of sherds that we were unable to actually assign to, a, to any particular vessel. So again, this sort of coherent exercise basically of, of, of demonstrating that within that short duration of the settlement, we have a, an assemblage that is completely contemporary with, with, with that settlement. So in the dynamics of refitting the pottery and refitting the animal bone, we were able to make links between individual middens and individual structures. And um, so this is structure one and this is structure four. These are the complete vessels in structure four. There's the nested storage jars. And then these are the broken vessels that have ended up in the midden deposits. And these conjoining lines show where certain sherds were left behind in the floors and things to give that link between individual structures and individual midden deposits. And the balance basically is that there are more pots inside the structures that are inside the middens. And again, I think that if the settlement wasn't burnt down and it lasted for, I don't know, five, 10 years and things, then the, the dynamic would change and it would be the middens that were, would have most of the pots and the houses the fewest. We took the pots and we also looked at the lipids inside those vessels to get at the diet of, or, of what was being eaten within the settlement and then whether that corresponded with the plant remains and the fauna remains and things. And we're able to demonstrate that the, the lipids gave signatures of fish and cereal and honey and dairy and non-ruminant meat and, and, and red deer. And also we got combinations or, or almost sort of, I don't know, recipes, I suppose, between certain of those, those signatures. So in eight vessels, there was red deer found in association with honey. So there's a real sense here of, of what was being consumed, but also some of the, what was on the menu within the settlement itself. Um, in addition to that, there's the, the pots and the animal bone. There was also the deposition of, of, of textiles. Um, and here we have, uh, this, is, this is basically what we encountered within structures as we're digging away the silts was these, these charred carbonized um, plant fibers, which turned out to be um, thread and yarn and, and, and actual fabrics and, and textiles themselves. So you can see here, there's a, there's a ball of a finely woven textile and here is a ball of um, fine thread or yarn and it's all being preserved by being carbonized they're plant fibers they're they're lime bast or they are flax um, they are we don't have any um, protein fibers um, preserved within the sediment but we think that might be because of the high sort of alkaline content of the of the silts generated by the shell content and things um, so this is an example of one of the finely woven textiles um, of the twining. This was from lime bast, um, a knotted net. But as well as finding um, yarn and, and actual textiles, we also found um, 30 of these plant fiber bundles. So these are basically where the, the beginning of the processing of, of flax to turn into actual yarn, but it hadn't quite reached that. And they were all the same size and, and turned up in caches inside individual structures. And in other buildings, we found these bobbins with yarn wound around them. Um, you can see just the, how spectacular that they are. To go with uh, that preservation of the, the organics, we also found the more familiar things that you'd find on a sort of less well-preserved site, which was spindle whirls and loom weights. So Susanna Harris and Margarita Gleber were able to say with confidence that the textile assemblage or the fibres and fabrics assemblage demonstrates all stages of production from fibre procurement to preparation to thread and element production through to the actual construction of fabrics themselves. And the distribution of these materials looks something like this. So we've got loom weights and plant fibre bundles and a fragment of a loom in structure one, whereas in structures four, two and five, we've got spindle whorls and bobbins with yarn around them. And we've got these scutching knives as well. So there's a sense of division of, of space and how that space was used. I realise that I'm running a little bit later than I thought. I think, is that okay that I continue? Yes, of course. Yeah, I'm going to keep going. I, I, I'm, I'm not that far away from it. So. 
Um, so this is, uh, as well as the, the pottery and the animal bone and the textiles, there was also the metalwork. Um, and it had uh, a similar sort of dynamic in terms of re relationship with the standing structures. So we've got, um, this is a, a hafted socketed axe found beneath structure one. And as you can see, it's half is not charred, so it wasn't part of the complication. Whereas beneath structure four, we found another half of axe where the half was charred by the, by the fire. There were faceted axes, sickles, razors, hafted spears, um, and a, a real sense of a, an inventory of, of metalwork, which I'll come back to at the end of my, of my presentation. As well as there being the wooden handles um, of, of the metal tools, there are also wooden buckets, um, chopping boards, platters, um, mallets, um, mauls, um, lots of sort of wooden artifacts and tools and things. Again, with a distribution that was similar to the pottery, so the complete forms were inside the footprints of the building. So they, obviously they showed more of the effect of the congregation, often they were charred. Um, and in structure three, we found the remains of a, of a wheel um, with the, you can see the, the axle sticking out here. You can also see the charring patterns and there was a fragment of a second wheel nearby. Just to sort of hurry through the sort of inventory, I suppose, of, of the material culture, in structures one and five, there are also the remains of these composite necklaces. So this is in structure one, there's an amber bead with a jet bead and a, a stone bead. And then in the same association, there are these glass beads that look a little bit like dissolving sugar lumps. You can see there's one there, one there. Um, the amber bead was burnt by the, the conflagration. And this is one of the glass beads. Um, the analysis of the composition of the glass has shown that the, the glass beads have a plant ash in their, in their chemistry that could only come from, from deserts and things. And the, best guess at the moment in terms of the origin of the glass beads is um, Iran. Um, and these are 9th century beads that were being made in, in the Eastern Mediterranean in the middle of the 9th century and then being exported to, to Mus Farm. There's also one bead that has a signature that rep matches something found in Egypt. We've got a tin bead that matches one found in Switzerland. The ambers are almost certainly coming from Denmark perhaps by our island. And then we have a Kimmeridge bead from the southern coast of, of the British Isles. So a real sense here of this sort of connections being made by some of the more exotic materials within the settlement plan. So altogether, the, the settlement in terms of, if we take the wood away and just have the uprights of the material culture look like this. So this is all of those different elements of the, the assemblages from the animal bone, the pottery, um, the, the wooden halves and the hammers, the wheel and things like that. So you can see that there's a correlation between structures, but also there are these sort of midden deposits around the outside. But best of all, I think about these, these spreads and things is that we're able to actually create individual inventories for individual structures. So on this, this, this image, I have um, buildings one, sorry, building three, building one, building four, building two and building three. And then with them, the different things that were found within them. So from livestock to lamb droppings, to troughs, moon weights, socketed axes, razors, sickles, pots and beads. And you can see that there is some sort of uniformity across structures as well as this sense of how amply provisioned individual buildings were themselves. So again, a, a real sense here that we can be reasonably certain that these are actually representative about what was actually happening within these, within these individual buildings. And maybe for the first time, we're actually getting a real sense of scale of what, what, what was happening in a, in a later Bronze Age structure in terms of its provision. If we just quickly go through the sort of deposition of those, those materials between structures one, two, four, and five, you also get the sense of the sort of spatial distribution. So these are all the complete pots. This is the distribution of the sickles and axes and spears and gouges and razors. These are the wooden platters and wooden buckets, spindle whirls and loom weights and plant fiber bundles and bobbins. These are shattered quernstones from um, processing the plant remains. 
We've also got seed caches of emma wheat and barley and flax. And then on top of that, the distribution of the glass beads. And just by putting the material culture onto the, the footprints of the buildings, you start to see a sort of left right divide. We've got these sort of busy spaces on one side of the structures and these near empty spaces on the other. And that possibility that this is the sort of sleeping quarters within, within the buildings themselves. And again, if we plot the lambs and the lamb droppings on there, you get a sense of, of that sort of frequency of pattern. So to come towards the end of my presentation, is there's, um, there's a sort of a real sense here of our confidence of the, of the context of our settlement in terms of the, its duration, in terms of the distribution and the use of materials within it. There's also an understanding of how accomplished these structures were and, and uh, the sort of, I don't know, the, as if it was, you know, common practice to build these structures and to occupy them. And if we do a sort of inventory of the materials that were found from the settlement and their relationship to the surrounding landscape, you can see that the bulk of the, the materials used in the construction and, and, and of the, the roundhouses um, comes from dry land or terrestrial sources. So the turfs, the oaks, the red deer, the pig, the flax seeds, the cereal straw and so on. There are some materials that sort of sit on that sort of margin, I suppose, the sort of wild boar and maybe cattle on the sort of fen edge and things the fish bone and some of the tubers and fungi. But the actual wetland component is, is actually very small and very specific. So those sort of small round wood poles that were used for the underfloor and the willow the wattle panels of the floors and walls, um, pipe bone from some of the fish that were being consumed and the rushes that were used in some of the roof lining and things. But there's this sort of paradox or, or disjunction here between these sort of people that are living on water, but that basically most of their resources are by sort of terrestrial origin. And that becomes more interesting when we look at the examination that was done on the, the parasites from the human feces that were found from the settlement. So um, basically the, 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 the feces were examined and the parasites that were found within there, the, the, the sort of, I suppose the the ecology of the guts of the inhabitants of, of our dwellings turned out to be dominated by aquatic parasites and so things like fish tapeworm. And there were none of the terrestrial indicators that you'd expect to find inside the, the stomach of our, of, our, of, our, of our inhabitants of our settlement. So there's a real suggestion here that our, our pile dwellers really were that, that they spent most of their time living on the, the rivers in the marshes, but they have this, this connection with resources from the adjacent terrestrial landscape. Um, and just to mention quickly, really, that uh, we did find human remains, but they were not the, the remains of the inhabitants. They were fragments of, of, of people that were basically incorporated into the settlement. These were the, the relatives, the ancestors. Um, this is a skull that was found in the midden associated with pottery and, and, and animal bone. Um, and we found pieces of at least um, uh, two individuals um, from within this, within this context. So just to say about the, the end of our settlement, the conflagration was total. It burnt the settlement down and, and almost certainly burnt it down in minutes. I don't know if you know, there was a reconstructed pile dwelling in Scotland recently that caught fire and burnt down. And it, they basically said in six minutes, the entire structure had disappeared in the fire. So there's this sense that the conflagration is also part of the dynamic of the, of the preservation of these amazing depositional patterns that I've been describing. And we're able to start thinking about that, that duration and the start and end date of the settlement by starting to plot some of the sort of seasonal indicators that come from the overall assemblage. So our oak and ash piles were failed almost certainly in the late summer, early autumn. We've got red deer um, unshed from, from the skulls, so that, that gives us, again, that sort of indication of, of when they were being consumed. There is fodder crops that we're finding from the land droppings. Um, there's uh, ivy pollen in the honey, and there's also, there's a, an absence of fruit seeds and, um, in, in, a, in, a, in the coprolites. There's the three to six month sheep or lambs within caught within the fire, and that idea of, of, of basically of their, their lifespan. 
there's also this real sense that we've got single crops in terms of the seed caches. Um, and there's a real sense that the possibility that are in, in line with the lack of stratigraphy and that indication that the wood was still green at the point of the conflagration, that our settlement was built, I don't know, September, October, one year and was burnt down July, August, the following. And in that sense also that the absence of woodworm or any, any sense of, of emergence of woodworm with any, any of the structural timbers, again, sort of points towards that being the case. And then that absence of terrestrial um, bacteria or, or sorry, parasites within, the, within the, the coprolites suggests that any visit to land was very, was very infrequent, or if, if it was frequent, it was very short, um, short forays rather than any long-term movement on land itself because it's reckoned that with, if you spend more than two weeks on land, that you should have terrestrial roundworm and things like that within your, within your guts. So just to sort of sum up really, I think, is that idea that our settlement, um, we've got construction, occupation and abandonment, but we've got an abandonment that was unplanned. And it's the unplanned abandonment of the settlement that's given us this sort of rich detail of, of, of what was actually present within a, a later Bronze Age settlement. Um, and this sense of the quantity is actually a direct reflection of that of that catastrophic end, and it and it's basically the sort of taking the, the the people that are living with the settlement by surprise. And I think that gives us a sense that we are actually seeing the full range and proportion of objects which were in circulation at any one time in the past in systemic or living context. So to go back to our plan of our settlement and our ideas about what Fenlon brings to the, to the story and things is that, that sense that we've got a set of five roundhouses built within a enclosed settlement on a river. We've got equivalent inventories um, from individual households, and we've got this uninterrupted occupation with sporadic or fleeting terrestrial forays. So these are truly our pile dwellers. Their, their surface available for settlement is not the dry land, but it is the wet, it is the rivers and the peat itself. And that whole idea about where we should be looking for these, these past inhabitants of Fenland is, is sort of turned on its head in the sense that the, the pattern lies there out in the, in the deep sediment. And that sense really, I suppose, of, of the earliest story of people moving from island to island by building these causeways is now being replaced by the sense of settlements actually on the wet and the land itself being the sort of resource and this goes against a lot of the stories that used to be told about Fenland, really, this idea that people live next to their wetlands because of their rich resources and that were adjacent. And in a sense, it was there for fish and fowl, whereas our settlement seems to be suggesting that the, the fence was there to be occupied, but it was the terrestrial landscape that was being exploited. So to, to sort of finish off, really, this is a, a reconstruction of that densely vegetated landscape and the location of the moss farm pile dwelling within that space. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark, for this talk. This was really, really interesting. Um, yeah, I'm really just reading this was just a lot of information. It's really, really cool, really interesting. Very, thank you very much for this. Um, thank you everybody else for listening. Um, I've counted there were up to 62 people listening to this talk now during maximum um, attention, so to speak. So yeah, I'm really thrilled about what you've been sharing with us about this site. Um, I think we can stop the recording now, please, and we will then move on to the question and answer session. And one question has already been posted in the chat, and as soon as the recording has been stopped, I will read out this first question and then 